And now let's briefly talk a little bit about cognitivism. Um, so you'll notice here that we're starting to have some overlap with some of the ideas we're talking in our next module on constructivisms, since theorists like Piaget and Vygotsky were also very influential in this movement towards a more cognitivism perspective on learning. So in the late 1950s, we started to see a shift towards learning theories from the cognitive sciences. And this was because behaviorism wasn't explaining why or how people made sense of and processed information. So what are the actual mental processes that were at work here? So we saw a shift away from the emphasis on overt observable behaviors that we very much saw in behaviorism. And instead, educators and psychologists began to stress the importance of complex cognitive functions. For example, thinking, language, problem solving, information processing, concept formation. And psychologists working within this realm claimed that prior knowledge and mental processes not only played a bigger role than stimuli in orienting behavior or response, but they also intervened between a stimulus and a response. So here they are building on the principles of behaviorism, but they were switching the emphasis within this vein of thought towards promoting mental processing that would lead up to a response. And so in cognitism, learning is understood as being an active process of knowledge construction. And it isn't looking so much at what learners actually do, but more so what they know and how they come to know it. And an analogy you'll often hear when we're talking about cognitism is this idea of the mind or the human brain um, of our learners being like a computer. So talking about knowledge in terms of information or data, um, talking about learning as inputting and storing this data, a thinking as being processing, remembering as retrieving, and communication about being the transfer or exchange of information. So these are all terms that we use when we're talking about computers as well. And some big names in cognitivism are Edward Chase Tolman, uh, Jean Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, and Jerome Bruner. I actually have one of Jerome Bruner's um, books on my desk right now. Um, and German Gestalt psychologists were another big one. Uh, we're going to be talking about Piaget and Vygotsky on our next module, so keep them in mind for our next module, and we might also talk a bit about um, Brunner that week too. Uh, but Tolman here is the one who's often credited with really being the pioneer of the cognitive movement in the 1920s, with some experiments he was doing with rats navigating mazes. And he found that the rats knew how the maze was structured because they developed mental maps of it, and they did this without the reinforcement that we would see in behaviorism. And then by the mid-1950s, cognitism um, became very popular in education. Um, and there are quite a few specific theories that come from this cognitive perspective. Um, like I said, um, Piaget and Vygotsky, who we'll talk about in our next module. Um, but generally what unites a lot of these is that they often examine how individuals process the information they receive to generate durable mental representations. Um, so a good example of this is information process theory, wherein learning is defined as a series of transformations of information within the brain. Another theory that falls within this um, is Bandura's social cognitive theory. In some place you'll notice that Bandura is mentioned under behaviorism, and sometimes he's mentioned in cognitivism. Um, this is because his theory was initially called social learning theory, and it had more of a focus on behaviorism. But it evolved over time to be more aligned with cognitivism. Initially in his original social learning theory, he argued that individuals learn by observing others, individual behaviors, attitudes, and outcomes of those behaviors. Um, and then later on, as this developed, he changed this theory to be called social cognitive theory. And in this, he also emphasized the concept and role of cognition and environment. So within social cognitive theory, the individual is triangulating between personal factors like um, cognitive, affective, and biological events, and environmental factors, and behavior in the learning process. And cognitivism was also mentioned in our article on gaming. So this article said that cognitivism works better with games that have more elaborative narratives, um, so like adventure games, or those that require a far more complex play structure, like strategy games. So these are better explained by cognitivism than behaviorism. And in these games, we can still see elements of behaviorism, like reward and punishment. But games that are more aligned with cognitivism may require the player to do some hypothesis testing to figure out what's going to work best in different contexts or when circumstances change in the game. Uh, so in games like this, the players are having to consider a combination of um, the observed consequences from their own actions, as well as processing situational factors and testing out different strategies each time, like considering the map, the nature of their enemies, uh, available resources for them, things like that. Um, and this chapter also talks more about gaming in relation to information process theory and Bandura's social cognitive theory. So if you're interested in those, um, I do recommend checking out this article. So let's talk about a few implications here for planning to teach. 
So educators employing cognitivism should have an emphasis on active involvement of their learners in the learning process. And this also includes metacognitive training, as was mentioned in both the um, Ertmer and Newby article and um, the Yilmaz articles, um, such as self-planning, goal-setting, monitoring, revising techniques. Um, another thing that these articles also talked about was cognitive task analysis, which isn't something I'm as familiar with. Uh, my understanding is that this is a method for analyzing and representing cognitive activities that learners utilize to perform specific tasks. And I know many of you have a background in psychology, uh, so please do feel free to chime in here. I'd love to know more about this. Another thing we want to consider is really focusing in on how we're actually structuring, organizing, and sequencing information in our teaching to facilitate optimal processing. And related is creating learning environments that both allow and encourage our learners to make connections with the information they've previously learned. Because in cognitivism, it's important that our instruction be rooted in students' existing mental structures to be effective. And this ties in with the attention that we're paying to how we're structuring, organizing, and sequencing the information so it's meaningful. Another important implication here, actually, is also the role of feedback and how it's different from a cognitivist perspective versus a behaviorist perspective. Uh, so while feedback or reinforcement in behaviorism is trying to modify a behavior in a desired direction, Within cognitivism, feedback is meant to be more of a guide and support towards accurate mental connections. So while it is a bit different, keep in mind what they have in common here is that they're both correspondence theories of learning. So while there are some differences here, epistemologically there is overlap because they're both measuring how well, so how accurately or correctly, the learner's internal subjective interpretation matches or corresponds to the objective external world or truths. Um, and here we have some examples of some cognitive strategies you can use in your teaching. Um, so analogies and metaphors are really great within cognitivism, as is framing, outlining um, mnemonics. Um, concept mapping is one that I really enjoy using. And then the Yilmaz article also gave some specific examples of teaching methods you can use. Uh, some of these start to tread a little more into the realm of constructivism, which is because um, the works of Piaget and Vygotsky are also quite important in cognitivism. And we're going to impact that further in module three. But the examples I gave here were cognitive apprenticeship, which is very heavily influenced by Vygotsky and his um, theory of the zone of proximal development. More on that in our next module. Reciprocal teaching, which is based on the information processing theory. And this is a strategy that's really a dialogue between the educator and the students about parts of a reading. Um, and it asks students to use four strategies in the dialogue, including summarizing, question generating, clarifying, and predicting. Anchored instruction, wherein teaching is designed around anchors that involve some type of a case study of a problem situation. So teaching and learning is anchored in a realistic context, and it encourages the learners to formulate answers to questions. Inquiry learning is another one, which aims to help learners develop higher order thinking skills, having them investigate an issue and formulating or testing hypotheses to find a solution to a problem. Discovery learning, which encourages students to discover principles and important relationships by engaging in them in activities like asking questions, formulating hypotheses, doing experiments and research, and investigating a phenomenon. Um, and problem-based learning, which is hugely popular in health professions education. And fun fact, uh, originated here in Ontario at McMaster University. And we are going to talk about this one more in depth in Module 3. And limitations and critiques of cognitivism. A major critique here is this whole analogy of human brains being like computers. Um, it's very reductionist. And realistically, our brains and learning are much more complex than a computer. And cognitivism um, underestimates the social, cultural, and other environmental influences on learning. And it's been criticized as being overly focused on individual cognition and learning. And I think I'm going to end things here for today. Uh, this video is already way longer than I intended it to be, so I'm going to have some major editing to do. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about what you discuss in your MLC groups this week. So let me know if you have any questions, and as always, I will see you all online.